It's time for another edition of Lewis at Large, 60 minutes of smart talk radio featuring guests from all walks of life in conversation with your host, Warner Lewis. So sit back and lend us your ears for the next hour. Now here with today's first guest is the host of Lewis at Large, Warner Lewis. Welcome everybody to another edition of Lewis at Large. Yours truly Warner Lewis from the flight deck and of course, As you know, that means some smart talk radio is in your future in this segment. uh, An interesting one indeed. A little history uh, here for us, which is always a a very, very good thing. We're going to be talking to a very prolific writer, John F. Wukovitz. His previous books include the highly praised One Square Mile of Hell, Pacific Alamo, and For Crew and Country, a brand new work called Hell from the Heavens. It is a fascinating story of the USS Laffey uh, and World War II's greatest kamikaze attack. Uh, It all happened in 1945. We'll get into details later. But it is a story, undoubtedly, that most of you uh, are not aware. uh, And John will enlighten us indeed, I'm sure. John, how are you, my friend? I'm doing fine, Warner. Thanks a lot. It's it's a great day to you know be coming out of the winter we had here in Michigan, and and you guys did. Uh, it, it feels good. So life is nice. Well, uh, just recently, uh, seventy years ago, uh, we suffered a brutal attack uh, in Okinawa by uh, twenty-two Japanese suicide aircraft. And I don't want to get too deep into the story. I'll let you tell it. But why, uh, uh, of all the stories, and there are so many of them out there, why was this one of particular intrigue to you? Good question. The, um, I had, my previous book was about a ship, uh, the USS Samuel B. Roberts, a destroyer escort. And after I finished that, uh, my agent and editor, were, we were just chit-chatting, all right, what would you like to do next? And uh, they were in favor of a, a ship, you know, another Navy story. And I remember reading part of a book by the skipper of that ship, um, and uh, by Commander Becton. And I, I looked into that, and so I thought, well, you know, this is a story that really has not been out there since Commander Becton wrote his book, and that was to a small market uh, some 30 years ago. So I thought, why not do this? It's a wonderful story. As I dug into the Laffey story, I found out even before the April 16, 1945 attack, the ship had been involved in, in numerous actions, uh, any, any one of them of which was uh, you know, other ships might have been proud. Uh, they were at Normandy uh, for D-Day and in three or four actions in the Philippines, at Iwo Jima, etc. So they had quite a record. When you uh, Ed, when you do this kind of research, uh, is it still possible to find those that were directly involved that were there? Are they are there any still living? Yeah, there's uh, right now. There's probably twenty to twenty two or three survivors, and I was able. Some of them are in, are in great shape. Some are not. Uh, I was able to interview uh, ten or twelve men who uh, who were very. Um, clear about everything and you know as if it happened yesterday and uh, three or four in particular so i was able to get those stories plus the um laffy website the guy had been keeping up stories through the years so some of the men who are no longer uh, with us had contributed their little reminiscence to that so that added another 15 or 20 uh, stories that came from the guys who were there uh, Commander Becton, as I say, wrote a book about it, and, um, and so that helped, obviously. Um, but those days now of historians being able to rely on survivors are, are fast coming to a close, as you know. I'm working on another one now, and uh, uh, there's still a sufficient number of men, but in a few years, that's going to be, uh, wow, it's, uh, down to a couple. Yeah, indeed. Well, let's do this. Let's uh, give our Lewis at Large listeners here, give us the setup here. Uh, if you could describe the situation, talk about uh, the Laffey, why it was there, and, and and what actually happened on that day, April 16, 1945. Okay, well, the, the invasion of Okinawa was the uh, precursor to eventually invading the Japanese home islands. So the Japanese were going to mount uh, as, as big a defense as they could at Okinawa, uh, because, you know, the next step would be Japan itself. 
So part of their plan was to have their land troops on Okinawa delay the American forces landing on that island, which would force the United States Navy to stay offshore and protect them and bring in supplies and things like that. With the Navy offshore, they would Japan would then unleash a series of the ten huge kamikaze raids. And those raids would devastate, they, they hoped, the fleet and cause the United States to rethink the invasion of Japan and you know, maybe ask for peace or come to a, some kind of negotiation or whatever. So these raids were, were designed to inflict the terror on the ships. Now, to protect the American forces in Okinawa, the U.S. Navy put a, a ring of picket ships around the island. There were 16 different stations along the most likely routes that the kamikaze aircraft would take. The worst of those picket, uh, picket spots, and they all were, were bad, but the worst of them was picket station number one. It was the most northern spot closest to the home islands. So any raid coming out of the home islands, that station was going to get a hit first. That's where Laffey happened to be on April 16th, a picket station number one. They had dreaded receiving orders to go there like any destroyer crew for a couple of reasons. First of all, destroyers like to be aggressive and go on the attack. At a picket station, you're just there waiting. You're like a scout cruising back and forth over a couple of miles, and that's it. Secondly, most every ship that had been assigned to pick and station number one had either limped back with severe damage or a couple been sunk. So the chances weren't great. I mean, the guys figured, okay, we get an order to go to pick and station number one on Friday the 13th. Our ship number, 724, equals 13. Sailors being a superstitious lot, uh, they had a lot going against them, they thought. So that's where Laffey was on April 16th when these kamikazes attacked. They were supposed to give a warning to the ships closer to Okinawa and to the land forces, hey, here comes another attack. The very nature, as you said, of destroyers was to is to go on the attack. What are the, the crew and, and, and the, the men on that ship, what are they doing? What, what are they thinking mentally through all this? Well, they they didn't they knew what to expect actually because they had been a, a charmed ship up to this point. The only time it had really been hit with anything was off the coast of coast of France, and the shell was a dud. So they lucked out there. But they had seen other examples of what happened to ships when one plane came in and attacked the the ship when a kamikaze hit it especially a ship called the Hughes, a destroyer. Uh, the, uh, they steamed right by it in port, and they had a chance to look at the damage after the Hughes was hit, and guys were looking at the spots where their battle station happened to be, and they'd notice it was mangled and you know, charcoal, burned, etc. So they knew what could happen if they were attacked. They also knew they had plenty of gun power to fight off kamikazes. But if a multiple amounts, amount attack, then they had a problem. Because while you're fending off one or two, another three or four could be charging in from the other side. Uh, so the issue was, okay, can we take care of enough kamikazes until help arrives, or will they get us? Other crew of other ships had even warned them, you know, on picket station number one, you're going to be able to knock down a couple of aircraft, but sooner or later, one of them's going to sneak in and get you. So that was their mind frame. They they really yeah. were not very positive. I mean, they, they, they didn't go in expecting to die, but they sure were not expecting to come out unscratched. Again, if you just joined us, here's truly Warner Lewis from the flight deck of Lewis at Large Radio. And in this segment, uh, a good one indeed. We're talking to John Wukovitz. He is a prolific author, in particular about World War II, the brand new work called Hell from the Heavens. Uh, it is the epic story of the USS Laffey uh, and World War II's greatest kamikaze attack. Uh, happened the morning of April 16, 1945, so some 70 years ago. And. Uh, 
Well, John, uh, knowing uh, that these ships that are in essence on point, or they're not really doing recognizance, but in some ways they are, but uh, is there a reason why they weren't in for If they knew these things were going to happen, uh, could they have done something differently? And another question on this same line is, how many, uh, at any one time, how many point ships, so to speak, or how many points would there be, uh, for example, in the Asian theater? Were there several or just one or two? Well, first of all, the, the, there were the 16 picket stations around Okinawa. Right. And there, there were not many actions going on at that precise time elsewhere in the Pacific involving major forces. They had all assembled here for Okinawa. And the rest of the forces were pretty much preparing uh, to, to hit the home islands. There were some units of uh, the uh, Army still in the Philippines mopping up. I'll call it mopping up, although it was uh, hard work, dangerous work, etc. But this was the, the main focal point, certainly for the Navy. Now, there, there wasn't much you can do as far as uh, can we do something else besides picket stations because someone has to be out there first. I mean, if you if, to, to find out, all right, here comes the enemy, you're, you're like a tripwire. Uh, on land, you know, if you watch movies uh, like Platoon, there were some of the soldiers stationed ahead of the main force to give a, a warning to the ones behind, here they come. And that's sort of what Laffey was doing. Uh, they weren't sacrificial because not every ship was hit or sunk, but it certainly was not an enticing post, but somebody had to do it. And uh, that, that's what Laffey was doing on that morning. And April 16th happened. Uh, the first plane came in at about 8.30, 8.27, actually. Uh, the crew put up a, a heck of a fight. The first eight kamikazes that approached, they shot down. They, they all were splashed uh, by an assortment of the gun power. And then numbers 9 through 16 came in in a short period of time and just lambasted the ship, uh, especially the after part of the ship. I think it's pretty hard ever to talk about, uh, particularly about a single ship, without talking about the nature uh, and the quality of the commander. Let's talk about uh, F. Julian Becton. Tell us a little bit about him and uh, his background and and how his personality and, and his philosophy shaped the entire ship. It did. It, uh, I find that with most success stories, the commander has so much to do in that. Becton went to the Naval Academy and uh, came out of there with the tendency of learning from past commanders, past generals, past captains, past whatever. He read a lot, read biographies, and he had a habit of jotting down things that he came across that he thought would were helpful to him, were valuable. And uh, one of them was uh, treat the men decently, treat them equally. You know, they're, you're their boss, but it doesn't mean you have to uh, treat them like dirt. So he had the crew's welfare at heart. He had seen other ships earlier, before he had Laffey, other ships damaged. One of his ships had been sunk, and he was determined not to let that happen again. He, um, he said, I'm going to lead these men into battle, but it's on my shoulders to do expert navigation and maneuvering, and that's what I'll do. To succeed, he knew you had to train a lot, and so he was huge on training. Now, every commander is supposed to be big on training, but not every commander is. You know, we're, a lot of people are supposed to do things, and they, they end up not doing it. Well, Becton certainly did. And as they were on their way to the Pacific, he switched the focus of his training to anti-aircraft fire. As he knew, okay, this is an air war out there. Uh, the, the Japanese are, are coming at us, and my, uh, especially the 40-millimeter and 20-millimeter guns have to be ready, uh, their, their crews ready. So he was... Quite pre- had him quite prepared for battle. Another factor was his calmness. There was one of the characters in the book, Ari Futridis, who observed Becton very carefully, and he liked what he saw initially, but he said, you know, I want to see what this guy does under action, so I'm not going to form a, a set conclusion. Afterwards, 
and by afterwards, just off of the Normandy coast, he noticed how calm Becton was, and he that sold for treatise on his skipper. A calm skipper leads to a calm crew, and I think that was one of the major factors that helped them pull through. What, uh, as you compare this theater, as you compare this attack, uh, what would you liken it to? What imagine? For us to imagine sitting here uh, in the safety of, of our homes and, and, and out uh, even, frankly, on the streets in the Midwest, can't imagine what a kamikaze attack would be like. Tell us how long – I mean, they're all different, obviously, but but how long do they last and how do you know that it's coming and how do you know that it's kamikaze versus other? I mean, those seem like simplistic questions, but realistically, for the men on the deck of that ship, tell us about it. Yeah, well, well, Becton said, uh, fire at any at any plane you see it coming. Uh, don't worry about identifying it. If they're approaching our ship, they're enemy. So fire at them. Now, the, the, the American Combat Air Patrol was not there. It was supposed to be, but it was absent. Becton lost communication with the four, they're called CAP, Combat Air Patrol planes flying at lower altitudes because they're the radio uh, had been so clogged with other messages for other operations on the island of Okinawa. Eight other aircraft flying at higher altitudes had been lured away by the Japanese. So it was a matter of any plane who came in, they just fired at. And how much time do you have? You mean how much time does a crew think they have? Yeah. I mean, Um, when you see these things coming. These kamikazes could travel a mile to two miles in about a minute and a half or two. Uh, They were coming in pretty fast. So what they did, they they held their fire until it came within their range. You know, each gun had its own range. The five-inch could shoot first and uh, throw bigger shells at the Japanese. And and those five-inch guns did shoot down the first three planes. Uh, first four, actually, in combination with uh, some others. Uh, then the 40 millimeter, and then finally the 20 millimeter guns, the smallest. They would join in when the kamikaze came within their range. The guys on the ship knew if they heard the 20 millimeter guns start firing, they better prepare. Because that meant the kamikaze was way too close for their comfort. Right. And especially the guys below decks, you know, the ones on deck can sort of see their sector. They're not looking all over, and they're blocked from view by uh, whatever. But the guys below decks could see nothing, so they depended on the hearing. They they said, all right, that's the 5-inch guns firing. Uh, we've got time. Come on, five inch, get that plane. And then the forty millimeters would open up. A much different sound of that weapon. And then finally, the twenty millimeter. We started to brace for an impact. Right. What? Uh, and again, is it possible? And again, I, I know everything. <laughs> everything is very specific. But a kamikaze hit. Uh, by an aircraft, uh, the size of the aircraft versus the size of the destroyer or any other ship, how many does it take, would it take, in your opinion, to sink it? And again, I know there's lots of other factors, but I mean, are we talking multiple hits by multiple planes, or could one plane, in in fact, take an entire ship down? Uh, yeah, one, one kamikaze could take down a destroyer. If depending on where it hit, you see, like like some of the um, aircraft might hit against a sturdy gun mount and explode and do some damage there, certainly, and the men near it would be would killed, but it wouldn't be in danger possibly of sinking the ship. But if it hit in a part where the damage would go and open up a hole to the interior of the ship, and fire would spread and hit the uh, ammunition storage rooms then that ammunition explodes, and there you go. Uh, so it depends on where the plane hit. Uh, Laffey was hit pretty much on every angle. The, right. the first four planes that hit were, were sort of in the aft section, which was fortunate, not for the guys there, but for the ship as a whole, because the the main part was sort of in the middle, you know, the bridge and uh, uh, the combat information center, uh, the the brains of the ship, so to speak, uh, the engine rooms, fire rooms, etc. Uh, if they left those alone, which they did in the early, very early part of the attack, Laffey could still go. But when they started hitting that, then uh, the ship was in danger. 
Um, one of the aircraft took out the Laffey's rudder, so therefore Becton could not maneuver the ship. It kept going in circles. Now, that makes you just a dead target. You're, you're going in circles, so Becton would speed up when an aircraft approached and slow down when there were no aircraft because they had a few intervals of, you know, five to ten minutes scattered throughout. And he slowed down because of the fires in the aft, the back part of the ship. Every time he sped up, those the winds would right. pick up the fires. So he'd slow down so that his crew could battle the fires. When a kamikaze approached, he would speed up. But still, he had to go in circles. So uh, his maneuvering talents were certainly on display that particular morning. What about, uh, and, and again, I want to get back to the book, but just one last question about just the whole concept of the kamikaze attack as a strategy. In general, uh, uh, is it, it's more difficult, uh, I would think, to be firing and, and aiming at people from a ship that is moving, yet at the same time, you'd want to be moving versus just sitting still in the water, I would think. Yeah, the, that's the thing. Uh, their, their saying was uh, a ship that could move was a ship that could live, basically. If you you can't go, then the kamikazes can just uh, easily come in and, and pick you off. So you kept moving as much as you can because, first of all, you don't know the quality of, of the opposition you're dealing with. Some of these kamikazes were unskilled pilots, and some were quite skilled. So you, you kept moving to try and keep out of their way. Beckton tried to maneuver the ship so it would bring the greatest number of guns to bear. And it was usually broadside, it's called, so it could bring his broadside to bear. And, uh, and just keep, keep on moving. That's the key factor. Now, it's just as hard then for the gun crews on the ship to hit that plane because the ship is moving. I mean, it's, you know, people think, well, gee, they had a, a gun sight there, and they all, don't you always just have to put the plane in the gun sight and then shoot? Well, imagine you're on a moving platform when you're trying to shoot a BB gun, and then the wind kicks in, and then the excitement of the time, you know, you're, you're emotional, you're, you're scared, uh, and all those factors. Accuracy is sometimes not as much as it could be during training. What, uh, as we start to wind down here, uh, John, uh, what, again, it's, it's, there's probably multiple ones, but what do you see as the big takeaway here? And what do you see sort of as the lesson as sort of the look back, again, specifically about the attack on the USS Laffey? What, what's the lesson out of all this? I guess that, that bravery comes from unexpected places. Uh, you know, it's not every, every brave action is not a, a John Wayne kind of action that you see in the movies, and that, that certainly might date me to the audiences mentioning John Wayne. Um, the, uh, it, it comes from the, the kid next door who leaves high school and enters the Navy and, boom, is in the thick of battle. Uh, guys like Tom Fern, who was, was that way, uh, and yet uh, uh, almost sacrificed his life in fighting fires. He did survive. The, um, uh, sur- the heroes are the ones that could be the quiet ones that uh, just suddenly in the midst of uh, um, an intense situation rise to the occasion. And I think that's a lesson for all of us, uh, because when I ask these guys, do you think you're a hero? Did you do anything special? 100% say, no, I was just doing what I was supposed to do. You know, that's it. And they shrug their shoulders. And when you think of it, people who do what they're supposed to do may be fewer and far between uh, than we realize. I mean, look at all the people in the world who don't do what they're supposed to do. And... um, uh, you know, from politicians to sports people to whatever. Yeah. So, you know, that's a good lesson right there. Let's just do what we're supposed to do, as these World War II guys did. Well, it is a very fascinating, intense look uh, at a very, very uh, difficult day in American military history, April 16, 1945. The work is called Hell from the Heavens, the epic story of the USS Laffey and the World War II's Greatest Kamikaze Attack, written by John Wukovitz, again, a prolific author uh, of World War II history. Hey, John, uh, uh, how can our listeners find out more about the story uh, of the Laffey and get a copy of the book? Well, they can, they can go to my website if they want, uh, They and, and order it there. They can go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, pretty much anywhere. 
Um, I suppose the best place to start if they want an ascribe copy for sure would be my website, thejohnwilkovich.com. Well, appreciate your time today and uh, would love to have you on again. Uh, undoubtedly, you've got something new in the works. I do. We're, um, uh, I'm in the early stages of researching the story of a unit of destroyers. It's called Destroyer Squadron 21. The, um, it's a, a unit basically of 10 ships. It, it came, some ships came and went for various reasons. And uh, they were there pretty much from the early stages at Guadalcanal uh, and then led Halsey's Armada into Tokyo Bay to end the war. So it's a story of that squadron. Uh, so when it comes out, um, uh, I, I would certainly love to be back on your show. Sounds like a great idea. Hey, listen, have a great year, and uh, we will talk to you again in the future. Thanks a lot. You bet. Bye-bye. We'll be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large. Well, welcome, everybody, to another edition of Lewis at Large. Uh, yours truly, Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck, and, of course, that means... Some smart talk radio is in your future, and in this segment, uh, a subject that uh, we have talked a little bit about, uh, we will talk about it in depth, and that is drinking in particular with young people, and even more particular amongst college students. Uh, what is it all about? And uh, uh, no better authority than Randy Havison. Uh, he is a leading addiction and substance abuse counselor and author of the critically acclaimed book, Party with a Plan. And uh, he has some strong opinions about that. Very happy to have him here. Randy, how are you, my friend? I'm doing great. How are you doing this morning? Well, we're good. Uh, good. You know, uh, this is a college town, and college yep. students drink, and they drink a lot. And yes. I'm curious, from your standpoint, uh, do they drink more than their counterparts of 10 or 20 years ago, or is it overblown? No, it's pretty much the same as it always has been, the number of students that are drinking in a high-risk way. So we haven't really seen an upsurge. It kind of swings a little bit, but there are no major uh, upswings or downswings in the number of students who are, who are, who are misusing alcohol. What, uh, why, uh, first of all, how did you share with our Lewis at Large listeners, if you would, how did you get mm-hmm. uh, into this business and why is it so, why are you so passionate about it? I am so passionate about this because nobody ever taught me how to drink. It was always, hey, let's go out and get smashed or let's go get hammered. And there were no boundaries put on me, so I just went crazy with it. And uh, I ended up becoming an alcoholic. And I've been in recovery now for over 30 years, and my life has turned around. But I thought, you know, i got to find a way to teach these students how to be safe with alcohol so they don't end up going down that same road. So you say it's not much different than before, and yet kind of like smoking for baby boomers, there's all kinds of available information out there now, is there mm-hmm. not, about the dangers of overdoing it? There are, and there is a lot of information, but it's amazing. Once people get three or four drinks inside of themselves, all of a sudden, all of their logic goes out the window. So one of the things that I do with Party with a Plan is I give people specific guidelines on how to use alcohol in a way that's going to lower your risk for getting in trouble. What, um, so, so what you're saying, <laughs> it's a handbook for drinking, is that in essence what it is? Exactly. Yeah, my, my friends are like, "Wait, hold on. You're in, you're a recovering alcoholic that teaches people how to drink." It's like, "Yeah, that's what I'm doing." So I found a formula and a method that teaches people how to drink in a way so they don't get in trouble with alcohol. Don't yeah. get in trouble, meaning not meaning getting no drunk or not driving drunk. No DUIs. No fights with friends. Uh, sexual assaults go down. Uh, when people party with a plan and they use this formula on a consistent basis, then they find that they're not missing classes. They're not waking up feeling horrible in the morning. They're actually waking up feeling refreshed and feeling good about the choices they made the night before. What, um, when, as you put this together, this is, uh, after a lot of the work and the input you've got from counseling over the years, tell us the science behind mm-hmm. it. 
The science behind it, I've been involved with higher education since 1990. I was the coordinator of alcohol and other drug education on three college campuses. And I was going to conferences and looking at the research, and I wanted to find out what are those breaking points and what are the ways that people drink and what are the fine lines that d- differentiate those who are drinking and they're okay and not getting in trouble and those who drink and they do get in trouble. So I came up with my zero, one, two, three guidelines as a way to teach people what those lines are in order to stay safer. So everything that I talk about in my book and in my lectures is completely research-based. How good a job are American universities at trying to patrol this, uh, incentivize um, less drinking, discourage uh, over-drinking on their own campuses? You know, I think colleges make great attempts to lower the risks, and there are some good programs out there. But again, I think it comes down to giving students the skills they need to make good decisions. So up until now, the messages that we've been giving to college students is, you know, just say no, which we know means absolutely nothing to most of the students out there. And the other one is be responsible. But what I found is that that term really means nothing, because if you ask five different college students to define responsible drinking, you get five completely different answers. So it basically invalidates that phrase. So what Party With a Plan does, it actually puts up a speed limit. That's the way that I define it. Just like on a road, if there's no speed limit on a road, people are going all over the place. And, and there's really no way to gauge what's safe on that road. So by following the zero, one, two, three guidelines, it's like putting up a speed limit that says if you follow this speed limit, your chance of getting in trouble is pretty slim. And we also know that the more you go over the speed limit and the more often you go over the speed limit, the more you put yourself and others at risk. So the guidelines actually give that speed limit and help students to realize what their conscious decisions are in regard to alcohol and whether they're going to be low risk or high risk. One and of, students love this program. Why don't you, uh, let's do this. Uh, again, if you just joined us, you're truly Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck of Lewis at Large Radio. We're in the middle of a segment with Randy Havison. He is uh, one of America's leading uh, alcohol and addiction experts talking about a simple plan, this one, two, three, uh, regarding students and their drinking. Uh, Randy, share with us a little bit, at least the tops of the trees, about zero, one, two, three. Tell us how sure. it works. Okay, here's how it works, and here's how simple it is. The way, I, the reason I start with zero is that I think we would all agree that sometimes zero is your best option in any given evening. Like if you have a test the next day, a paper's due, uh, you have a job interview, you're not feeling well. Uh, you didn't sleep well the night before if you're on medication. There are a number of reasons where zero is your best option in any given evening. And when I talk to students, I find that when they get in trouble, they say, you know what, I knew that last night was a bad idea for me to drink, but I did it anyway. So listen to that voice. There's always another time. If something's saying, don't do it tonight, don't do it. But if you are going to drink, the one, two, three part is to have no more than one drink per hour with a drink defined as a 12-ounce beer, a 5-ounce glass of wine, or a 1-ounce shot in a mixed drink. So no more than one per hour, no more than two times a week, because studies show that people who drink three or more times a week get in far more trouble than those who drink two or less. And then the three is to have no more than three drinks in any 24-hour period, and again, spaced an hour apart. So if people follow those guidelines, then their chance of getting in trouble is much, much less. What kind of reaction do you get from college kids when you talk to them about this? You know, a lot of them say, wow, you know what, this really makes sense. I don't know if I'm going to do it all the time, but it makes sense. And what I say to those students is, you know what, that's okay. If, if you, every now and then, if the speed limit is 55 and you go 65, okay, well, you're putting yourself at some risk, but I wouldn't suggest doing that all the time. So what I suggest to students is every now and then, pull it back like twice a year, of the month of February and the month of September, and just do the zero, one, two, three, and see if you're still in control of the alcohol or if it's turned and now the alcohol is in control of you. Because alcoholism is a very tricky disease. 
And it's not like you can go to the doctor and get a test and it's like, oh, yeah, you came back positive for alcoholism. It's not like that. So I wanted to give students and, and people in general who choose to drink a way to kind of gauge themselves and say, am I still in control of my drinking or have I crossed that line and now my drinking is in control of me? Is it necessary, maybe it's a stereotype, but is it reasonable to assume that those that live uh, in the social groups, the fraternities and sororities, they are going to be tempted more and have easier, either, either easier access or it's certainly more prevalent? Or do you agree with that? Oh, I do agree with that. Yeah, we do find that within the Greek system, there is a larger proportion of students that drink in a high-risk way. And a lot of it has to do with peer pressure. And it has to do with the expectations that are put into place by the administration of those organizations. Now, I know more and more fraternities are attempting to change that culture, but it's going to be really difficult. I mean, we're talking about changing a century of behavior, but it's going to take a while. And my hope is that, you know, there will be some fraternities and sororities who are going to implement party with a plan and say, you know what, these are our guidelines for our chapter, and we want our brothers and sisters to stay safe. But it's going to take a while to convince them that this is a plan that's going to help save lives and and reputations and people's college careers. Randy, what about uh, the drinking habits, the differences between uh, college or females and males at college level? Tell us about that. You know what? That's a really good question. I'm glad you brought that up because it used to be where men were what we call binge drinking or high risk drinking at a much higher level than women were. But what we're finding with the current uh, research studies that are coming in is that women are catching up. You know, there are a lot of ways where I definitely support equal rights for women, but when it comes to high risk drinking, uh, that's not one of them. And I, it's really scary to see the number of women who are misusing alcohol because uh, it can turn into some really scary situations for them. And, you know, women being of a more petite stature for the most part, uh, alcohol is going to affect them differently. So three drinks for a woman is going to be the equivalent of four or five for a man. So it's really important for women to be more careful when it comes to their drinking choices. And, in fact, right now, I'm working with a collaborator uh, on writing Party with a Plan for Women so we can address the, the special needs of women when it comes to the use and misuse of alcohol. What about, uh, and again, on college campuses, you've got a lot of kids away from home for the first time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of freedom there, a lot of things. They're experimenting, testing limits. Uh, worse with freshmen than with seniors? Absolutely, yeah. We find that freshmen have a definite spike in, in the amount of alcohol they use and the number of problems they get into. And the problem is with these college freshmen, you know, what they don't realize, it's much easier to create a reputation than it is to change one. So when they come into college and they start drinking in a high-risk way and people start to know them as the partier, then later on when they want to mellow out, people are going to come up, come on, man, just have a couple more with me. So they have to realize that the reputation that they set up for themselves at the beginning is going to be the reputation that's pretty much going to carry them through. So they need to be really, really careful with how they set it up. But another thing that people don't realize is that about 25% of all college students do not drink at all. They just, for whatever reason, they choose to be abstinent, and they're having a really good time and a great college experience. So another thing I want to teach college students is you don't have to drink to have a good time in college. You know, my favorite example is my nephew, who's a second semester junior at a college back east, and he's never had a sip of alcohol in his life. And he is having a blast in college. He has a lot of friends. They do a lot of different activities. You know, it's not like he's not drinking, so he's sitting in his dorm room every night going, well, I guess if I was drinking, I'd have fun. It's not like that. So, it, you know, it bothers, it's, it's disturbing to me that college students think alcohol is the only way they can have fun because there are so many other ways, and especially out there, in, in your town, there are so many different activities on campus for people to get involved with that alcohol doesn't have to be the number one social lubricant. There are other ways for them to have fun without harming themselves or others. We're with Randy Havison, one of America's leading uh, addiction uh, and alcohol counselors and speakers, speaks across the country 
uh, an exciting new plan called 0123, uh, designed to help college students manage uh, their alcohol intake during their formative years, those four years uh, or more uh, on their college campuses. Uh, Randy, what about, uh, let's talk about the the beer companies, uh, the liquor companies. Mm. Uh, the exposure is everywhere, whether it's television or online or in the bars, point of purchase, etc. Mm-hmm. There's lots of temptations and lots of marketing dollars are aimed right at that group, aren't there? Oh, lots of dollars. I mean, let's look at the Super Bowl. Peyton Manning wins the Super Bowl, and what's one of the first things he says? I'm going to go home, give my wife and kids a hug and a kiss, and then I'm going to go drink lots of Budweiser. Yep. And we have since found out that the reason he did that is because he owns a couple Budweiser distributorships. So that was a pure marketing ploy on his part in order to sell more of his product. So, yeah, alcohol is everywhere in our society. And what I'm hoping to do is bring better awareness to this as, again, like I said, drawing that line between this is low risk and safe, safer risk, safer use, and this is high risk or more unsafe use. So up until now, we haven't had that, and the beer companies are just making a mint advertising their product. You know, you look at the ads for, for beer and for liquor, you know, what's that one, the most interesting? Interesting man in the world. Of course, he's drinking beer. So, you know, it's it's amazing to me that we keep buying into this stereotype. And it's just like with tobacco. When we were having uh, TV commercials for tobacco, there was greater use of tobacco. But we cut that out, and now we're seeing a drop in the use of tobacco. But alcohol ads are still out there by the dozens, and we're seeing a large percentage of people misusing alcohol. So, yeah, we well, needed. That. It would be great to see that cut down a little bit. Well, college students or not, we know that that the pure numbers and the odds of people, uh, certain people listening to this program, also struggle probably uh, at some point with with drinking too much. Again, zero one two three really works for pretty much anybody, I would think. Anybody who chooses to drink, 0123 is, is a formula that's going to keep them safer. And one of the other parts of my book uh, is I talk about different questions to ask yourself at the beginning of the night. Who, what, where, when, how, and why. So that you have a better idea of what you're planning to do that night. And it's important, again, to stick to your plan. Party with a plan. So knowing who you're going out with, where you're planning to go, why you're planning to drink. You know, are you drinking because you're feeling nervous or uncomfortable? Are you drinking to celebrate? Are you drinking to commiserate? You know, it's amazing to me that, you know, when, when the basketball team wins, everyone goes out and drinks. When the basketball team loses, oh, we lost. Everybody goes out to drink. So, you know, it's like an excuse to go out there and do it. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking to change this culture a little bit and help people to, to make more conscious choices and have that plan before they go out. What about, uh, again, so many states have changed liquor laws and they have raised the drinking age. And mm-hmm. a lot of people, particularly in college towns, will say by doing that, all they've done has, has driven the 3.2 alcohol sort of beer drinker of the past, they're now doing it on their own and they're going out to liquor stores getting hard stuff and sort of partying on their own. Yeah, no, that's really not true. The reason why the drinking age was raised to 21 is because, and, and the number one reason, is because the government took a look at deaths on the highway as a result of the misuse of alcohol. And they found that in states where the drinking age was 21, the deaths on the highway were lower than in the states where the drinking age was 18. So they did an experiment, and they took a couple states, and they raised the drinking age from 18 to 21 to see what would happen. And they found that the deaths on the highway actually lowered when they raised the drinking age to 21. So that's when the federal government said, okay, you're going to raise the drinking age to 21 if you want federal highway funds. So that's right. the reason why it happened. And when they rose the, raised the drinking age to 21, then they found that in all the states where they raised the drinking age, that the number of deaths on the highway went down. Right. So that's the reason why they did it. And just, I, I just know that a lot of people have said one of the side effects of that, though, was that you now have 18-year-olds that are partying. Instead of going out and having just three, two beer, as so to speak, 
until they were 21, they're now bypassing that step. And uh, anyway, it, it's probably a little bit more prevalent in college towns, I would think. But what about yeah. also when you talk to, undoubtedly you talk to school administrations, you talk to the medical community at some level, and certainly the counseling community, what are they saying? How are they reacting to the whole concept of 0123? They really like it. In fact, I just got back to, and I was speaking at a couple colleges up in Northern California about implementing Party with a Plan as their campus alcohol prevention strategy. And I laid the whole thing out with the books and the posters and the wallet cards and facilitators' guides and trainings, and they loved it. So more and more campuses are coming forward saying, hey, we want to implement this program on our campus. So it's just thrilling to me to be able to have something that can finally help people and and give them ways to keep their students more safe. So, yeah, the the administrators love this program because it's not abstinence-based. It's saying, if you're going to do it, go ahead. But here's how to do it in a safe way. Do we need to start uh, getting this kind of education to kids when they're in grade school? You know, or somewhere, people somewhere say, early. why don't I do Party with a Plan for high school students? And you know what? It's never going to happen. I will never teach a high school student how to drink because I truly believe that in high school the best option is to not drink at all. So you know, I think there are other ways to help uh, grade school and high school students, but I think it, it comes back to teaching them better senses of self-esteem which is going to be another book of mine coming up soon. But it's about teaching them how to be confident and comfortable with who they are and not depending on anything or anybody else to give them those feelings of feeling like they're okay. So I think if we give uh, high school students and grade school students better life skills and better coping skills and a better sense of values and self-esteem and how to make good choices for yourself, I think that's going to play a bigger part in lowering the alcohol incidences that happen later on in college and later in life. So besides interviews like these, uh, how are you getting the word out and trying to spread the word about 0123 to, to, to that special college, that 18 to 22-year-old? Mm-hmm. Well, last month I was exhibiting at a conference down in Orlando, uh, and I spoke at the NASPA Alcohol and Other Drug Conference, and there were 800 people there from colleges all over the country, and I was exhibiting Party with a Plan, and I did a presentation. So now all of those people know about Party with a Plan. This week I'm going to a conference called First Year Experience, so I'm going to be talking to colleges that are working with first-year students, freshmen, and I'm going to be introducing Party with a Plan to them to let them know about how we can help them on their campuses. So I'm going to some conferences. I'm doing a lot of these interviews, which I think are great, and I really appreciate the time on on this station, and especially out there in Lawrence, because I had such a great time last time I spoke out there. Your students are amazing. I love them. So it's it's things like this and and the website and SEO and social media and all that stuff. That I'm old school. I don't know about all that. I need to hire college yeah. kids to come and help <laughs> yeah. me with all that. Yeah. But we're slowly getting the word out. But I just released the book in, in November. So it's still pretty new, and we're getting it out there. And I'm thrilled with the reception that we've been getting so far from administrators and from students. You know, uh, we're not too far away from spring break, uh, that annual yep. ride of spring where everybody hops and or maybe eight or nine people hop in a car and head down to Daytona or somewhere like that. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm trying to imagine you on a stage, uh, some MTV kind of music concert stage on a beach, trying to t- <laughs> explain 0123. That probably might be one of your worst nightmares, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yes. But uh, what I do like, though, is that what we're finding more and more is that less students are engaging in that behavior. You know, the reason why that became really popular was back in the days of, you know, Playboy magazine, Spring Break issue, and MTV was doing their Spring Break break parties, and that's where it kind of popularized that notion. But what we're finding more and more is there are hotels in Panama City and Daytona who are saying, we don't want college students in here because of the damage that's done. So their students are finding less and less places to go and, and engage in that type of behavior. But what I'm also finding is that more and more colleges are putting together what's called alternative spring break programs, where the students for that week will go 
somewhere in the world or somewhere in the country and do service projects, Habitat for Humanity or Aid for the, the People in Haiti. And they'll do these different programs so that students will be of service during that week rather than going and trashing themselves. So it's really nice to see that. And I'm sure over there in your town, University of Kansas, I'm sure they have amazing alternative spring break programs. So I would encourage students to look into what's available and being a part of that over spring break and doing something good for the world rather than going out and trashing yourself. Well, the work is called Party with a Plan. Uh, Randy Haverson and uh, one of America's leading addiction and substance abuse counselors. Uh, it is a subject that uh, will be talked about probably infinitum. But uh, Randy, what uh, you, you touched on it, what, uh, what's next for you? Uh, what's next for me is just putting the word out there and getting more books in people's hands. Um, there's a lot of information, resources, research on my website, partywiththeplan.com, and I'm just going to continue to work really hard at getting the message out so that we can keep these kids safer. And so those, uh, whether it's faculty that's listening, parents, anybody that's listening would like to pick up a copy, how do they do that? Uh, they can go to my website and click on the store and order copies right off of the website. Well, appreciate uh, your time today and appreciate the work and the cause that you are doing. And it's uh, you're not telling them don't drink. What you're saying is drink with some sense of a plan and some sense of structure to it. And uh, mm -hmm. that's probably uh, logically uh, a pretty wise thing to do. Listen, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate the time. You bet. We will be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large.